Welcome everybody to Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. Uh, we're going to continue on in this little mini series that we started last week about lung ultrasound. And if you didn't get a chance to uh, go to watch last week or to be in, um, present for the last week's lecture, it is now live on YouTube or it's published to YouTube. Uh, so you can go back, you can check it out um, and see kind of what we talked about last week, get caught back up to speed and then if you're watching this one on YouTube, I guess you can hit pause, watch that one, come back to this one, pick up where you left off. If you're live and in person, well, hopefully you're here last week and, you know, whatever. Uh, just go check it out on YouTube. We got it up there. Uh, it's a great forum that we've been able to use to publish this content and hopefully get this out and helpful uh, in, in the hands of people who are scanning at the bedside. So without really further um, delay... I'm going to switch on over here to today's presentation, and we're going to pick up kind of where we left off last week. Today's topic is we're going to talk about ultrasound or POCUS looking at pleural fluid. So last week, if you remember correctly, uh, we talked about the basic uh, lung ultrasound findings, and those are essentially lung sliding, right? Is there lung sliding? Yes or no. That kind of looks at the presence of a pneumothorax or, um, you know, some other sub sub things, but mostly pneumothorax. And then we followed it up with the A, B, and C profile, right? A lines, B lines, consolidation profiles. And where we left off, what we didn't really address was pleural effusions, right? And we'd be remiss to kind of completely ignore the whole idea of pleural effusions because that's a huge part of what lung ultrasound is and can do for us. And this is one of the huge benefits that that lung ultrasound can provide um, for us as we kind of scan, uh, scan our patients. And so uh, with that said, with that introduction, we're going to dive into where we left off and talk a little about lung ultrasound and specifically five findings and if you remember these five findings, they can really help us identify if there's an effusion, uh, yes or no, on these patients. So that said, I got no disclosures to make uh, for the for this lecture, and so we'll move on. So the first thing that I think would be helpful is for us just to generally define a pleural effusion, right? Uh, so that we're all on the same page. We kind of understand this is what we are talking about. Um, so then when we start putting this sonographically or looking at this sonographically, we can refer back to this common definition, right? So I just wrote out the definition. Um, so this is the Matt Tabot Dictionary, right? A pleural effusion is a collection of fluid in the pleural space in the chest cavity. Pretty basic, right? We have basically uh, on either side of the mediastinum, right? We have the the, the pleural space, right? It's covered in the uh, parietal pleura, right? The lungs are covered in the visceral pleura. And in between the visceral and parietal pleura is a potential space, right? If the lungs are well aerated, it's really not much in there, right? Um, but it's a potential space where we can put fluid and that fluid can collect and cause abnormal and bad things to happen to the chest and to the lung. And so if you think about it, physiologically, there's always this kind of an influx of fluid um, into this space, right? And there's always an efflux of fluid out of this space. It's just as it's created, it's reabsorbed. That fluid does serve a purpose, right? It kind of helps lubricate that surface so that when we breathe, the lungs just expand and collapse smoothly and efficiently. And, um, you know, it makes breathing easier, as easy as possible. And so, um, you know, when you have processes that either increase the rate of production of fluid or decrease the body's ability to absorb said fluid, uh, then we have, you know, a mismatch, right? We have an accumulation of that fluid and it just sits there in the chest, right? And as you can imagine, what would happen when you put this fluid in the chest and it starts accumulating is it's going to start crowding out structures that are there, right? The thoracic cage is a relatively non-compliant space. Right. Um, you can argue that the diaphragm has a little bit of compliance to it, you know, by definition of what it does. But certainly it's not going to allow for just infinite expansion of fluid, you know, that uh, that the lung is going to be able to put displace, you know, um, downward so at some point that lung is going to start compressing um up against the lung and preventing the lung from fully expanding right and so we're going to start at some point having some influences on the lungs ability to function as we put fluid in this space right and then we have patients that present in all sorts of ways you know with symptomatic you know whether it's shortness of breath or you know they're hypoxic or anything like that um and so kind of this is the the conundrum or the the situation or situation or the scenario that we're dealt with you know when we're at the bedside is does the patient have you know this patient who's got dyspnea or hypoxia or whatever does do they have fluid in their chest that's causing some of this you know this symptomatology right and this is where our test is going to come in so if we go back to that cartoon image that we were looking at last we kind of modified it for today's purposes so again we have the rib rib those oh um 
those gray ovals We've got the muscles in between the intercostal muscles in between the ribs right that that light pink represents the lung the green in this situation represents either the spleen or the liver right pick whatever side you want and so that black curved black line is the diaphragm right and so a pleural effusion is going to be basically fluid that's interposed between the thoracic wall or the diaphragm in the lung right um and so we're just going to see that um fluid as we as we scan through these patients and just kind of as a a uh, kind of a introductory image we're going to come back to this image multiple times to look at the multiple different things that can cause lung uh or can be reflective of, of a pleural fusion so this is going to represent that that liver right with the, the bright white diaphragm we'll show uh, some images where they're labeled in a little bit um, and then that lung is a little bit collapsed and consolidated and pushed towards the head and there's that black anechoic fluid that's kind of surrounding the lung that's normally not there. And that's the pleural effusion that we're going to look for. Um, but before we get into the findings, I guess one of the questions is, okay, that's great, Matt. You know, you've got this ultrasound machine, right? You can take it to the bedside, you can scan and you can find this fluid, but really do I need to do this? I mean, I don't want to get up from my chair. I don't want to go into the room with the ultrasound machine. It's going to take me time. It's something else I have to learn. And there's a certain limited quantity of things I can learn before things start falling out of my head. Right. So what is, why do I bother doing this? Like, is this going to really, really help me at the bedside? And to that, I'll turn to this book, right? This is a book that came out a couple of years ago uh, by Dr. Larry Estrell called The Pocus Manifesto. Right. And if you haven't had a chance to pick it up and read it, uh, you definitely should do it. Um, it is a, it's an interesting book. I, I'm, I'm unclear uh, as to exactly who the target audience is, whether it be physicians like us or lay people who, um, who may pick up the book and kind of read like, what is this whole ultrasound thing, right? Um, and I think that's probably a good thing because he's able to write about ultrasound in a way that captures the history of bedside ultrasound, right? And also talks about here are the major things that bedside ultrasound can actually do um, in the test you that test characteristics and how bedside ultrasound is really superior to previous forms of of workup that we've had in the past and how and he makes the, the argument that our ultrasound ought to be the next iteration of our ubiquitous diagnostic tools like the stethoscope has been over the last couple hundred years, right? And so um, if you haven't read the book, pick it up, um, read the book. But he has an interesting chapter in there about, well, it's got several chapters about lung ultrasound and one specifically about pleural ultrasound, right? Looking for pleural effusions. And he has this really cool chart, right? This really good chart where he basically looks at the literature and says, look, if you have an effusion that is above or below 300 milliliters, what is the sensitivity and specificity of either your physical exam, your one view chest X-ray, or your ultrasound, right? And so above 300 mLs, um, you know, your, your physical exam is pretty lousy. Like basically take a quarter, flip it, um, and that's going to be your test characteristics, um, ruling in or ruling out a... Um, a, a pleural effusion on your on your physical exam right chest x-ray can perform a little bit better when you see it it can be decently good almost 90 percent uh, but to rule out a pleural effusion on chest x-ray can be very very challenging right in fact one of those resources i said or read um said that you needed to have i think it was like 175 mls of fluid in the chest before an effusion will even show up on an upright chest x-ray and then you lay the patient down which is what we do for all of our trauma patients right and that that um amount of fluid just goes way up that you need to be able to see a pleural effusion or i guess stated differently the test characteristics of a supine chest x-ray just tank when you're looking for pleural fluid right um and so this is really an opportunity for the bedside ultrasound the point of care ultrasound to really shine because the test characteristics for fluid uh, suggests that it is very highly sensitive and very highly specific for ruling in or ruling out a pleural effusion, right? And by effusion, you can talk about whatever type of fluid you have, happen to have in the chest, uh, but it's very, very good. And it certainly outperforms a chest X-ray and it certainly outperforms a physical exam. And the studies that I looked at said you need only need as little as about 20 milliliters of fluid uh, in the chest before you can actually see it um, on lung ultrasound. So your sensitivity is going to be extremely good with bedside ultrasound. And so I think this, you know, this chart alone kind of gives a, a, a good argument for why you ought to 
listen to the rest of the lecture, right? Why you ought to share it with your friends, right? You ought to give it a like uh, on the YouTube channel, why you ought to subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, but really why you ought to bring the, the machine into the room when you're scanning uh, to look for pleural effusions in the patients, right? So with that said, uh, the first question we probably should answer is how do we scan and where do we scan, right? Because last week we did a lot of work on the anterior chest, right? Um, and so that's represented by those two small little ultrasound probes kind of in the middle of the patient's chest. But as we look for pleural effusions, remember, these are gravity dependent findings, right? Meaning when you put, let's just take a, a jar, right? The glass jar, and you fill it halfway up with water, right? We kind of intuitively know that when we're looking at that jar, the bottom half represents the water and the top half represents the air, right? And that's just a normal physics principle where things of, you know, lesser density rise and things of greater density fall to the bottom, right? And if you remember back, you was those uh, science experiments from when we were in grade school, where you put the water in and then you put the, you know, the, the oil in, and then you put some other oil in and you get those layered uh, or the different layers of liquids inside the jar and how you can kind of differentiate that, right? That's this whole principle of things that are lighter go to the top, things that are heavier go to the bottom. And the same thing applies inside the chest, right? So when you put fluid around the lung and or and or you put air around the lung, right? Where do you expect to see the air? Towards the anterior surface when you're laying supine, right? Uh, or up, right? Where do you expect to see the fluid? posteriorly as they're laying supine. So if you stand them up, right, it's going to be towards the diaphragm, the air is going to be towards the apex. If you lay them prone on their belly, now the fluid's going to be towards the, the anterior surface and the air is going to be towards posterior. So always be thinking, how is my patient laying? Where would air go, right? Where would fluid go, right? And so in this situation, the supine patients, that's generally how we scan all our patients, fluid is going to be in the posterior aspect uh, of this patient's body, right? And so we're going to want to take our probes and move them off the anterior chest and move them to the lateral chest. And you know what? If it starts looking really, really familiar, you're 100% spot on because this is basically a fast exam view where we move our probe just a little bit north, right? Get them a little bit above the diaphragm and all of a sudden we're right where we need to be. That posterior lateral alveolar, you know, space or the, um, you know, the costophrenic angle, um, you know, as it's elsewhere said. Uh, so basically go to the fast exam view, right? scan north and find the diaphragm and tilt and look up, right? And that's the views that we want as we're looking for pleural effusions, because that's where the smallest effusions are going to be. And if they have a large effusion, we're still going to see it there. And then you can branch out from there and say, okay, how far up does this effusion go? Either cephalad or how far anterior does effusion go? And we can use our probe to kind of size the thing. But when you want to first identify it, you want to go to those lateral spaces, fast exam views and kind of move up, right? So that's kind of where we scan. Now, the question is, what's normal? Like, what would we expect to see, right? And I want to start with this, because once we establish a baseline for it, this is what is normal, then we have a better understanding of, okay, something's deviating from this, this must be abnormal, right? So let's just start with a normal lung, right? Picture of a normal lung, it's a static image, gives us time to just kind of sit and dissect and think about this one and work through it, right? So this is a right upper quadrant view. If you want to go to the left upper quadrant, that's fine. Just imagine that the spleen will be a little bit smaller than the liver, but it should look relatively the same, right? So I put a little indicator on there so you can see what directions are what. So this patient is laying supine. So the anterior portion of the patient is, is a, a, towards the top. The posterior portion of the patient is towards the bottom. The head or the cephalad portion of the patient is towards the left-hand side of the screen or towards that probe indicator, right? And the caudal portion or the foot portion of the patient is towards the right-hand side of the screen, um, you know, on, on this image. And I guess this is a good place to stop. I, I know we've said it before, but I'm just going to reiterate it again. By convention, when we're scanning, right, you notice that probe indicator is on the left-hand side of the screen here. By convention, that probe indicator should be oriented towards the patient's head, right, or towards the patient's right-hand side when scanning. There is caveats for procedures and there's caveats for echo, right? But generally speaking, when you're scanning lungs or bellies or, you know, legs or anything else, soft tissue or anything else, the probe indicator goes towards the head or towards the patient's right hand side, right? And so in this situation, we see an anterior or we see a, a, a sagittally oriented image uh, with a probe indicator towards the left, which is going to be the patient's head, foot towards the right, right? So this is just kind of our, our basic orientation, right? Now let's add some, add some, um, labels here. So this 
first bright first landmark that we want to look for is this bright line that is immediately cephalad to the liver right i guess you can make the argument that the first landmark to look for is the liver right because that's the the easiest thing to find right um and then you kind of court you know triangulate with the kidney things like that um but the first thing that we want to do to identify after we've got the liver right is to find that diaphragm because this is critical to identifying what is the pleural space right um and I'll give you an example as an aside here. Um, presume, let's presume you have both a pleural effusion and ascites, right? You're going to have anechoic fluid on either side of the diaphragm. And so it can be very, very challenging to identify what where the fluid is, like what compartment the fluid is in. Is in. And is, in fact, this is for attendings out there. This is a, a good exercise for your trainees is find fluid filled, you know, spaces and say, okay, identify the compartment, right? And then you have to use these landmarks as clues to say, okay, I'm confident this is in the pleural space, or I'm confident this is in the peritoneal space, right? And so to make this differentiation, right, you have to identify the diaphragm as your principal landmark, right? So liver, it should be immediately, um, you know, adjacent to that diet or the diaphragm should be immediately adjacent to that liver, right? That bright line. Um, and then from there, we can identify anything above that or cephalad to that is going to be that pleural space where to expect to see lung or expect to see pleural fluid, right? Um, I labeled a few other things here. So you have that liver, kidney, um, deep to the kidney, you oftentimes have a striated structure, uh, especially in patients that are a little bit thinner, where you don't have a lot of um, either attenuation of fat in the near field or a lot of like, um, you know, intra-abdominal fat that you have to penetrate through. You may see that striated psoas muscle. And then again, we're going to come back to this later. You're gonna, this is going to become very important, but that lumpy black thing all the way at the bottom, that's going to be your spine, right? And we'll come back, like I said, we'll come back to that. Um, but with these normal anatomical landmarks in mind and labeled, then we can say, okay, this space that's above the diaphragm, right? This space that I've indicated in red is the pleural space, right? And in a normal patient with well aired lung, then it is lung, right? It's going to be that lung is going to be up and adjacent to the diaphragm um, in this normal patient, right? So as we kind of go back to this image, when we're looking for a pleural effusion, right? Remember, we were talking about supine patients where the the uh, fluid will accumulate in the posterior gravity dependent areas, we're going to expect to see fluid accumulate then in this graded fashion, kind of in this space that I've got labeled in red. So you'll have most of it down in that angle, right? That costophrenic angle. Um, and then it'll expand up from there, both cephalad, right? And anteriorly, right? So that's going to be how we expect to see the fluid accumulate and collect as we go through this patient's scan, right? So with that normal kind of anatomical understanding in place, I'd like to introduce to you this concept of five key findings, right? Five things that you can try to keep in mind as you go to the bedside that will help you identify whether this patient has pleural fluid or just normal lung, right? And I, I kind of have developed this in my own thinking over the years, um, because, you know, when you look at a, a an obvious pleural effusion, right, you only have to get, you know, to, I guess, number one, right? You look at it, it's like, well, that's clearly obvious, there's fluid there. Um, but I've found that because ultrasound is so good at picking up such small effusions, right, those 20 ml effusions, it can be very challenging to accurately identify whether or not they have small effusions, right? Um, there can be some lung curtaining effects that can kind of cover those up or this, the way, uh, the way it looks, you're like, is that an effusion or is that real? Right. And I've, I've had a lot of studies where I look at it and like scratching my head. It's like, I don't know, like, I don't want to overcall this one, especially in the context of trauma. Cause once you start calling fluid in the chest, that's opening up a whole Pandora's box of like, where are these patient's injuries, right? Are they bleeding into the chest? And now what I need to worry about. Um, and so it's really important to kind of scrutinize these. And that's where I've developed these kind of numbers three, four, and five that help me kind of go through this diagnostic algorithm of like, does this patient have, you know, a small pleural effusion, right? Like I said, if it's big, you usually got it by number one and two, right? So with that said, let's dive into these five different findings. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some examples, talk about kind of all these different findings about how they can be used to identify pleural fluid versus just kind of say this is a normal lung, right? So the first one is direct visualization, right? And as its name implies, it's just seeing fluid, right? So here's that cartooned image that we looked at before, right? And the darker pinkish color is going to represent the fluid in the chest, whether it be, you know, just normal, you know, fluid from a, you know, 
normal pleural effusion or whether it be a hemothorax from trauma or, or chylothorax or whatever it might be, right? Um, you know, the you basically just, you see it there, right? And so I guess, you know, let's not spend time on the cartoons. Let's actually look at people, right? So this is an example of, um, you know, a retic retic quadrant view. So you see that that liver and that kidney, you identify the diaphragm, right? That bright white uh, anechoic, or not anechoic, bright white hyperechoic line above that, di or above that liver, right? And we can see there is some black fluid, right? Some anechoic fluid that's existing in that pleural space, right? I can just directly see it. It's not, you know, not hard, right? It's pretty obvious, right? It's going to jump out and hit you in the morning. As long as you know what a normal looks like, you say this is abnormal, right? And so this is an example of that direct visualization. You know, in this situation, it's a pretty small effusion, right? We can uh, show an example of something that's a little bit larger, right? Um, and this is, again, the, the bigger it gets, you know, to some extent, the more obvious it gets. Once they're huge, right? Then you just have this big black void and it's like, what in the world am I looking at? Um, but this one's not terribly hard. And there's been a number of studies that have been done, like, how do I grade this thing? Can I give it a, um, you know, can I quantify the amount of fluid in here? And they've done some studies where they measure the distance from the diaphragm to the lung. And, you know, you can do some math. Um, I think for our purposes, it's probably most helpful just to kind of qualitatively say it's small, moderate, large. And you can, you know, my favorite tactic uh, when I'm not sure is to say small to moderate or moderate to large, right? It just kind of gives that range, but it reflects like the degree to which you qualitatively see that this patient has, has fluid. So this one would be kind of like a, you know, small to moderate approaching moderate, right? So um, size effusion, certainly as you get bigger, you can, you know, push the lung out of the way and you see more and more fluid, right? Um, so this is a basically a simple effusion. Um, the next example is going to be a little bit more challenging, right? So this is a trauma patient, right? And what we can see is, um, I believe this one's the, the left side. Uh, it's not labeled here, but if I remember correctly, it's the left side. Um, and so you see that spleen in this time, you see the kidney below it. Um, and then you have to look for that hyperechoic line. And I think I'll maybe be able to stop and um, you know, pause kind of that line of thinking just to illustrate one of the things that can be really, really tricky. And I've seen this happen. Like I've, I've been careful with this when I scan and I've seen this happen with new learners as they scan is they misidentify the hyperechoic line. And I've done this myself too, right? Um, I've misidentified the hyperechoic line, the capsule of the kidney and called that the diaphragm, right? And then all of a sudden the spleen then in this situation then looks like it's in the pleural space. But you have to be really careful as you're identifying your different structures, right? As you're getting your probe on there, you're finding things. Always challenge yourself. Is this truly what I think it is, right? Does this structure approximate what it should look like and so if you kind of block out and you put your thumb over the spleen in this picture you can see that kidney how you can kind of assume it's the spleen kind of mistake it for the spleen but then you look at it it's like no it's got that renal cortex architecture it's got that renal pelvis architecture that's not right if we scan up north we're going to find now we see the spleen which is in the middle of the frame here and then the hypercoag line above that is the diaphragm so just my caution is just be really careful, kind of be very, you know, be very meticulous as you scan. Okay, I found the kidney, I found the spleen. If you identify those two structures definitively, then the next, you know, hyperechoic line is going to be your diaphragm. Then above it, you're looking at your pleural space, right? And so in this one, we identified those two structures. And now I have something that's kind of vaguely hazy uh, that doesn't quick look, look quite right. It's swirling, right? Um, and this is going to represent an echogenic effusion, right? And so I think it just reminds us that not all pleural effusions are going to be easily and obviously identifiable as black, right? Some of them may be echogenic. Um, and one of the sources that I was reading this week basically said there's four types of effusions. I don't know if I would, you know, if you pressed me on it, if I would, you know, come down as dogmatically and say there's only four. But in this paradigm, there is a way of this is their way of kind of categorizing the different findings that you could see. And that was simple, right? Just plain old black echogenic effusion, right? Versus complex, which is kind of what we just saw, right? Anything that violates the the principles of simple, meaning it's just plain anechoic, right? And then there's septated complex and then homogeneous echogenic, right? And you know, again, once you get into the septated complex versus septated simple, like then the, the, the whole idea kind of breaks down. Um, but I think it illustrates the whole point that most effusions are gonna be just plain anechoic. A number of effusions are gonna be echogenic, whether it be homogeneously echogenic or heterogeneously echogenic, right? And then you may even find effusion, or, uh, effusions that are, have septations in them, right? And over the years, I've seen cases that have presented uh, with like a, you know, an empyema with septations and things like that. And so 
um, the more you see these findings, right, the more you can kind of categorize, I have an effusion, right, and they fit these different, you know, abnormal findings and things that you would maybe need to um, to take in mind as you're figuring out how to manage these patients, right? For example, if they have like a septated effusion, well, just a simple thoracostomy tube might not completely drain that. You might actually need to get in and break that up, right? I know the in the ICU, sometimes they'll use TPA to break that up. And if that doesn't work, then maybe you have to go in surgically and just kind of break up some of those adhesions and septations to allow the fluid to drain. Um, in the case, and I'll just go back to this image. In the case that we saw before, this is... Um, right here, this is a trauma patient, right? Um, and so this represents a hemothorax, right? Just a kind of a very fresh hemothorax uh, with that blood that's kind of swirling around, right? Um, and so the question that may come up is, okay, well, Matt, can you then tell me based on what I'm seeing, what is in this effusion, right? And the answer is, Probably not, right? You you can make some assumptions uh, based on what you're seeing, right? If you have a patient who's traumatized, right? They got hit by a car, they fell out of a tree or got stabbed or whatever the case may be. And you have something that looks like this, you know, first off, it's probably pretty safe assumption that they've got, you know, a hemothorax. But as you see these echogenic findings or this echogenic foci inside that uh, effusion, it you know, kind of lends credibility to that that assumption that it is that is a hemothorax right um you know versus let's make this a medical patient right you have this um very complex fluid in there you know we're probably going to lean more towards an empyema um but i certainly couldn't tell you that this is you know like a simple effusion versus a malignant effusion versus you know you know infusion from heart failure like you can't get that to that degree of specificity and you can certainly have an infected fluid that is anechoic and so i think while it's helpful to kind of push you one way or the other you cannot the sensitivity and specificity for what is causing the fusion is certainly not there uh when you identify kind of what the effusion looks like and so it's helpful but it's not a de definitive thing you're still going to have to do a thoracotomy or a thoracostomy um and and drain some of that fluid off and and send it for sample so uh, with that said, that's the first finding, right? Um, do they have a direct visualization or can you directly visualize the fluid? The second finding is kind of similar, right? Uh, at least in terms of one causes the next, and that is the contracted lung, right? And as you think about it, we'll go back to this, this cartoon for a minute. As you put stuff in that pleural space, and we've said this a few minutes ago, but we'll say it again. As you put fluid in that pleural space, it's going to fill up that space, right? Which means the lung does not have is much space to fill into, right? And since the lung is gonna be one of the most compliant tissues in this scenario, right? The lung is gonna take the hit and not be able to uh, fully uh, expand as we put fluid into that lung, into that pleural space. And so what we'll see is that lung is then gonna be displaced, right? And it's gonna start consolidating, um, you know, around the periphery as it's not able to pop open those little, um, those distal and terminal alveoli, right? So we'll go back to the image that we looked at before, right? We're gonna, again, we're gonna come back to the same images because you see these different findings in these same images, right? We see the, um, the liver and the diaphragm, right? We found the fluid, but this time I'm highlighting the lung right and as you can see instead of being nicely well aerated and up and against and abutting that um that uh diaphragm in the posterior portion of that pleural space it is now being pushed mechanically towards the patient's head pushed north right and you can see um a lot more consolidation of that lung right and so this is going to be an example of what happens and kind of you know, A leads to B um, in these findings. And so as you're looking at the patient, you know, you've obviously seen the fluid and then you can, the, usually the next thing that I do when I'm scanning is look for, okay, where is that lung, right? Because I want to prove to myself, this is a pleural effusion, right? And I'm, I want to prove in multiple different ways or five different ways, right? Um, and so what I'll do is I'll look and say, okay, can I find that little lung that's acting like a flag or whatever, you know, inanimate object you want to, um, you know, to, to make it look like um some people call this a jellyfish sign if you want to call it that's fine um but it's basically the lung is being displaced up so here's another example you can see that you know obvious effusion and then just kind of just to the left of that you see something floating in that and that's going to be the patient's consolidated lung and again we're going to go back to that same example here you see and this one's looking just a little bit further north um it's a different slightly different clip but same patient you can see that effusion right and then as you see the patient kind of taking those breaths and you know things happening you can see that lung just kind of flapping around inside that effusion. That's the consolidated lung, right? So 
those are the two main things. And oftentimes you'll be able to make the diagnosis of a pleural effusion off of these two findings alone, right? The direct visualization of fluid in the chest and the presence of a consolidated lung that's pushed a little bit towards the patient's head, um, you know, that's being displaced from that fluid. However, right, not all patients are this easy. And so we need to have some other tools in our tool belt that can help us as we kind of start working through some of these more complex patients, right? So the, the next one kind of in the level of complexity is something called the spine sign, right? Or um, there's one article I was reading this morning, um, they called it the V line, right? They were taking up the, um, the kind of that motif of A lines, B lines, they had other lines, and then the V line. I don't know. I learned it as spine sign, so that's what I'm going to call it. Um, but essentially, uh, it's another finding that can help us identify the presence or absence of, of lung. Uh, or of, of an effusion. So if we go back to something normal, right, this is a normal image. One of the things that's going to happen, and this is just straight up normal physiology, normal ultrasound physics, right, is, you know, ultrasound, like we said last week, is is dependent on sound either penetrating into the body and reflecting off something deep in the body or hitting a surface and reflecting off of that, right? And so um, in the situation down here to the right-hand side of the screen over the liver and the kidney, right? The sound is penetrating through the liver, through the kidney, into the psoas muscle. Um, and it's there's portions of it are being reflected at every level. That's what we can see, what we can see. But we get down to the spine, right? And we see that, re that reflection in those shadows of the spine kind of deep to that kidney and the psoas muscle and then, and then the spine, right? Remember last week, we talked about how the two enemies of ultrasound is air and bone, right? So we just identified that enemy number, you know, two, I guess, with the bone in the spine sign, but the enemy number one is the air, right? And as you have lung, normal lung kind of curtaining over an area, right? You're going to get this hyper echoic, you know, edge, leading edge, to that lung that, you know, in the anterior lung or the, the near field. And then you have this bad shadowing behind it where you just can't see anything because that lung, that air is obscuring the view of things deep to that, right? And we can use it. It's kind of annoying in a number of situations, but we can use it to our advantage here to identify where aerated lung is. And so in a normal patient, right, you will be able to see posterior structures up until you get to the point uh, where the diaphragm meets the posterior chest wall, right? Because at that point, um, at that costophrenic angle, the lung is totally inflated into that angle. And now you have an air interface that's going to block your visualization of anything deep to that and cephalad to that, right? And so um, that's just kind of normal physiology, right? Here's another example of, you can see, and I labeled them here for you, that line indicates kind of you know, that that where you expect to see things posterior versus not, right? But those asterisks represent the, the vertebral bodies. And you can see how you can see them all the way down uh, deep to the liver and to the kidney and to the psoas muscle in the, you know, caudal area of the field. But as you, once you get that costophrenic angle where that line intersects with the diaphragm, all of a sudden you can't see any of that anymore because that lung curtains it out of the way uh, and doesn't allow you to see it, right? Now, you can imagine, right, if I put fluid in the place where lung ought to be, right, fluid allows the transmission of ultrasound, it doesn't block it, right, I'm displacing lung towards the patient's head, so I'm displacing it out of the way, so it's not too hard of a cognitive leap to say, if I put fluid in there, which is an ultrasound, you know, allows ultrasound transmission, and I displace the lung, which doesn't allow ultrasound transmission, I now will be able to see posterior structures where you know that are that are deep to that fluid that were otherwise obscured by the lung or by the air uh, that was in the lung right um, and this is the basic premise upon which the spine sign is is built right and so here's an example going back to that image that we had before you can see now when i displace that lung out of the way right when i put fluid into that pleural space i now can see an extension of those humps that represent the vertebral bodies above the diaphragm, right? So if you don't see, if, if you can see them up to the diaphragm and then it stops, right? That suggests that the patient still has normal aerated lung. But if you continue to see those lumps above the diaphragm, and then this is dependent on the angle that you scan, like you have to be actually scanning towards the um, scanning towards the spine. But if you see that continue up, then you know that something's displacing that lung out of the way, right? And then add it to the items number one and two that we talked about earlier. And all of a sudden this supports your diagnosis of a, of a pleural fusion.
I think here's a better example um, that we should have been showing. You can see kind of that continuation of the spine as we continue to go uh, north of that diaphragm or north, north of that costophrenic angle, right? And so this is really helpful, right? This is called the spine sign. Uh, and this can help you identify the presence or absence of a pleural effusion, um, you know, and it's really helpful for, for even small ones uh, in the patients that you're looking at, right? So that's item number three. The fourth indicator, a fourth marker of whether or not a patient has pleural effusion versus um, versus a, a normal lung has to do with where are your beelines located, right? And if you just kind of remember from last week, just kind of a recap, beelines are an artifact that's produced by lungs, right? Uh, by thickening of the interstitial spaces in the lungs, right? And we talked about la last week, uh, how normal patients, since we're not completely arid, right? Normal patients will have um, some degree of beelines, right? We normally have fewer of them in our anterior lung fields and our uh, apical lung fields, and more of them in our posterior lung fields in our um, caudal lung fields due to just the gravitational pull of fluids on tissues, right? Um, and so as we scan these patients, you know, look for those bright white lines that start at the pleural surface and go all the way to the bottom of the screen. That's a beeline, right? Um, and you're going to, as you scan around, you're going to see them, you know, see a few of them here and there, right? And the more you add, the more likely you have like interstitial thickening, um, you know, for whatever cause that that, you know, patient may be presenting with, right? Now, take that idea, that principle, those B lines, right? And let's take that down to this costophrenic angle where we've been working, right? Here's a normal patient, right? And if you are very careful, if you look very carefully, you can see one B line, right? Right at the costophrenic angle. And I'm actually going to um, put this little carrot on there just to track it, right? Um, so we'll video clip I made this week it was kind of fun. Um, but you can track that carrot. You can see that one B line right at that costophrenic angle, right? So what does that tell me? I mean, you may think that this is just such something that's so like nuanced and subtle, and it is, right? But what does it tell me? It tells me that that interface, right? That pleural interface is up, right? That I have the visceral pleural, pleura up and adjacent to that parietal pleura, because I see that beeline emanating from the diaphragm, right? The B line is going to emanate from whatever the visceral pleural surface is, right? Uh, so if I were to push that lung out of the way, that B line would be deeper into that that chest cavity. So if I'm seeing B lines emanating from that diaphragm, it means that the visceral pleura is adjacent to the parietal pleura in this patient, right? Which means this patient does not have a pleural effusion, at least in this window, right? Now you have to fan through and scan again, get multiple. Um, views of that costophrenic angle, all that nuance aside, like because I see this B line emanating from the diaphragm, I know that this is a normal study, right? Here's an exa another example of a still study, right? Um, or a still frame where you can see a couple B lines that are emanating from that diaphragm. So this is why I say find your liver, find your diaphragm, right? And see if you can see B lines in that area, right? Um, now contrast that with this patient who's abnormal. Again, we have B lines, right? Um, whether this be from interstitial thickening or as we start consolidating lungs, maybe it's not completely consolidated, you're going to have an increase in the B lines because some of the alveoli collapse. Now, all of a sudden you get like two interstitial spaces that, you know, go together to make it one thicker one. So we start having this kind of this B line, you know, proliferation in that area of consolidated lung or collapsed lung. Um, but notice that you can clearly differentiate the edge or the margin where those B lines begin from the diaphragm, right? Which means something is between those two things, right? We have pleural fluid that is between those two things representing that patient's pleural effusion, right? So I know this one's very, very subtle and very, very nuanced. I'm gonna go back to the previous image where I can show the normal. But here we can see B lines that are emanating from the diaphragm, or they appear to be emanating from the diaphragm, suggestive of normal lungs versus B lines that emanate from the pleural surface, but is not adjacent to the diaphragm, suggesting that this patient has a pleural effusion, right? So that's item number four, right? And the final one, kind of as we wrap things up today, is this concept of mirror image artifact, right? And again, this one's really, really subtle, but it can be really helpful once you know what you're looking for, right? So a little bit of a dive back into some basic physics. Um, mirror image artifact is something that happens from time to time. It's basically uh, 
when you have you know, an artifact in ultrasound is a violation of of some physical principles like physics is going to do what physics does and the machine thinks that it's going to the the body's going to behave in a certain way and when the body violates what the machine's assumptions are because the machine's not as smart as the you know is the body right when the mach, when the body violates what the machine or the machine yeah, when I said that right, when the body violates what the machine thinks it's going to do, it's going to produce an artifact, right? Um, and so in this situation, there are certain surfaces in the body, the diaphragm being one of the main offenders, where because it's smooth, uh, it's also reflective, right? Um, the other places I can think of that can do this is um, the pleural space, or not the pleural space, the uh, pericardial space, right? It's a smooth uh, membrane that can cause this, this mirror imaging artifact. Um, but basically what you can have is you can have sound that's emanated from the transducer represented by that, that big dotted line. It bounces off of that curved diaphragm that assume it's a mirror, right? And then it bounces somewhere in a different direction, right? And in this situation, it's going to you know head towards that, that small blood vessel, right? Um, and then it, you know, because the angle of incination or angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incination, right? It's going to then reflect back from that blood vessel to the diaphragm and then from the diaphragm back to the transducer, right? Now, all the while, you've also had direct um, sound waves that, you know, go towards that, that blood vessel, which, you know, shows us the, the blood vessel in general, right? Like the reason why we can see that blood vessel where it is, is because we have sound waves directly going to that blood vessel, bouncing off, going directly back to the probe. But we have the secondary uh, wave that's going in off the diaphragm, bouncing off the blood vessel. And if you notice, I'll put it up here, you create a mirror image artifact. And I apologize, it's pretty dark on your screen. Let's see if I can, I don't think that really helps. Um, but there is a very, very subtle little rounded structure at the tip of that arrow in the thoracic space, right? That is the mirror image artifact of that particular blood vessel that is in that is actually living inside the liver right um and like i said you can see this all over the place around the pericardial space but the the diaphragm in normal lungs is a prime offender for this and so as you're scanning take take time slow yourself down look above the diaphragm and sometimes you'll see the liver reflected into into that that lung and it's not that you have like a liver in the lung right it's that mirror image artifact above the diaphragm and we can use this to our advantage because when you have a pleural effusion you lose this artifact right if you have normal well aerated lung you can have that mirroring into the lung right when you have a pleural effusion you lose that because now all of a sudden you see what's on the other side of the diaphragm like pretend like in this situation the reason why it works is like because you have that lung and that lung curtain, that lung, that gray shadowing, it's almost like it just, it's a, you know, takes an eraser to a whiteboard. Like you don't really get to see what's back there because of all that curtain, that shadowing that is protecting your, your vision from all the things that are there. And it acts as that canvas upon which then you can superimpose that mirror image artifact. And once you take that canvas away, once you actually can see what's behind the curtain, now all of a sudden you can see you don't see the mirror image you see what's directly there and i guess maybe um i don't know i may decide to cut this one out because it may just be an example that's i'm pushing it too far and it doesn't work but um one of my favorite musicals um is les miserables right i've seen it a number of times you know more than i can count on one hand um and i've seen it in a number of cities that's approaching the number of fingers that i have on one hand uh and i've seen it in a couple different countries two that i can think of i saw it in london i saw it here um anyway I love the musical. The more I watch it, the more I listen to it, the more I reflect on it, just the, the nuances and the subtleties of the storyline just comes out and it's just amazing, right? If you haven't seen it, highly recommend, go pause the video, go watch Les Miserables, come back and finish the video, okay? Um, but anyway, when you are in theater and you open up, the, like you're sitting there waiting for the thing to, to open up, they have the curtain closed, right? You can't see what's on stage, um, but superimpose on that curtain, they have a projection of this young girl. Right, the the iconic image um, of Cosette in uh, Les Misérables, right? Um, and then what happens is you can imagine, like, I mean, obviously it'll shut the image the the image off before the curtain opens. But imagine what would happen if you opened the curtain. Okay, all of a sudden you wouldn't be able to see that image that was projected, any, you know, very well anymore because now you have multiple different props that are going to be 
you know, in this, is, this is where the example breaks down, it's scattering that light. And so it doesn't really make sense as an image anymore. Um, but just think about it. One, you know, the reason why you can see that image is because the curtain is closed, right? And that's superimposed on top of there. And then when you open the image, open the curtain, now you can't see it. And it's the same concept here, probably push things way too far and completely lost all of you. Um, but that's the idea that we're talking about. Once you have, uh, when you have a plural effusion, you remove that canvas and you can't see that, that, um, that mirror image anymore. So here's an example where you can see that effusion um, and just you lose that mirror image artifact, right? So those are the five things um, kind of as we come back to to wrap this up uh, and conclude this lecture. Um, those are the five things that I think are really helpful as we kind of go to the bedside and try to identify does this patient have a pleural effusion. And so uh, just to remind ourselves, ultrasound is, is probably one of the best modalities that you have short of like CT scan and MRI where you're just taking the patient away from the bedside and, you know, using a very radiation intense or, or costly study. Uh, it's one of the best ways that we can identify both from a sensitivity and specificity perspective, whether or not the patient has an effusion, right? We certainly can identify small effusions based on this one, uh, based uh, using this modality um, compared to our physical exam and, and chest x-rays, right? And so I'd highly recommend that as you consider this, right, to, to scan your patients. And then as you scan your patients, look for effusions, right? You'll, you may find things that you're that you're surprised about or not expecting. Um, but just to remind ourselves, the five cardinal findings or five cardinal features that are going to help you identify whether you have pleural fluid or normal lung are going to be number one, the direct visualization of that fluid, right? Number two, the contraction of that lung as a result or the compression of that lung as a result of that fluid kind of compressing it up, right? Number three, uh, whether you're not where you have your B lines, whether they're at the diaphragm interface or if they're pushed up, um, you know, inside the thoracic, and you see some some split between the diaphragm and your B line interface, right? Number four, do you have a continuation of that spine sign above that costophrenic angle or above the diaphragm? And finally, number five, do you have a mirage, mirror a loss of the mirror image artifact in this patient? Um, you know, in the lungs above the diaphragm. So with that said, we're going to wrap things up here. Um, that's going to be kind of a, you know, the summary of, of a pleural fusion and how to find that. Um, are there any questions kind of as we come back to kind of land this plane here um, about pleural effusions, how you can use ultrasound to find them, things like that? I'll open up the floor. 